everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Bethany Hill McCarthy from IBM Research Communications, and I'm going to serve as your host today. We're looking forward to a lively discussion about how we're going to build a quantum workforce, and we'll talk about where quantum education comes from, what type of education or training is required, and what educators, companies, and even students can do to prepare for this shift, especially with the rise of digital learning. Before we get started, I want to take a minute, run through a couple of housekeeping items for today's discussion. First, thank you for joining us. I want to acknowledge this is a brand new virtual format for us, which we established in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we hope each of you are safe and healthy wherever you are. Second, there is a light in the top left corner of your screen. One is a blog post that describes IBM Quantum's education initiatives. The others are quantum education web pages for both educators and students. So feel free to take a look at those during the presentation or after, um, and we'll also share those links after the session. Throughout the event, you'll have the ability to submit questions for either all of the panelists or a specific one if you want to just learn more about a particular topic. You should see a little Q&A window in your screen, and that's where you can submit your questions. We'll try to save about the last 10 minutes for questions, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. In the off chance we don't get through all the questions, we'll keep a track of those and the IBM representative you've been reaching out to will contact you and try to get some time scheduled with one of the panelists afterwards. We'll also in the next day have a replay of the event available. So following this discussion, we'll share that link with you and all the other event resources. And with that, I wanna turn it over to today's moderator, Jeffrey Hammond, who's Vice President, Principal Analyst serving CIO professionals at Forrester Research. Jeffrey, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Bethany. Um, this is the second one of these sessions that I've been able to do, and it seems like every time I have one of these, I'm you know kind of talking to rocket scientists and really smart people, and that's the case again. Um, I write for CIOs and application development leaders, and I've been in the development space for about 30 years. And like many of my clients, I'm trying to put quantum into, into context. Uh, how big is this gonna be? Uh, how much of a change uh, are we gonna have to make uh, in order to, to take advantage of what's happening here? One of the aspects mm -hmm. of, of, of quantum though is also where are the people that are gonna know how to take advantage of this technology and produce this technology gonna come from? And I think that that's one of the things that we're gonna get the opportunity to focus on today. We've got some really great folks uh, to help us work through some of those issues. So I'd like to start out um, by introducing Abe, Tina, and uh, Javad really quickly. Um, and I wonder if you could just take a, a minute or two and tell us about yourself and how you are engaging uh, with uh, the community of technology professionals in the quantum space. Abe? Sure, thank you, Jeffrey. So my name is uh, Abe Asfal, and I lead a quantum education team at IBM. And really the goal of all of our efforts is to make sure that we can answer the question that Jeffrey asked, which is how do we build a quantum workforce that is now able to take on the opportunities provided by quantum computing and also contribute to the field? Uh, where are the developers going to come from? Where are the scientists and engineers going to come from? And what materials are they going to use as they learn about quantum computing? And Abe, you're an electrical engineer by trade, right? Working on a PhD right now in that space. Is that, that correct? Yes, exactly. So I studied electrical engineering in my undergraduate studies and also in graduate school uh, to learn quantum computing. I was actually studying in an electrical engineering department. So something we'll touch on later in the discussion is just how interdisciplinary quantum computing is. And so there's no real home department for quantum computing as it is right now. It stands in many different departments today. Cool. Um, Dr. Brower Thomas, how about you? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm a materials chemist, so I work <laughs> on the materials side of uh, quantum information science and quantum computing. And as far as uh, where I fit in working with those in the profession, I've sat on a couple of committees about what is the future of quantum information science education look, looks like. Um, and we've discussed with uh, industry partners, uh, uh, academia, and um, and I also engage uh, through my uh, research and also my role as education director for the integrated quantum materials with with the talent. And uh, you know they're looking for careers. 
they're looking for direction. The talent is there. The question is, how do you engage them and keep them involved? Thank you for joining us today. Dr. Shabani. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so uh, this is Javad. Um, uh, I'm an assistant professor at New York University, and uh, we work on um, quantum computing hardware uh, with interest on the impact and challenges that they provide. Um, this research lab basically uh, is working on how we can make a better one qubit level system and then how they can sort of like transfer maybe to industry for you know larger systems and how they can be uh, affecting the whole quantum community but being at the center of the city uh, we have access to a lot of uh, young resources uh, from high schools to undergrads um, you know city population obviously scales with the uh, interest of the students uh, want to work on this space and i guess hopefully we will share some of these experiences today Cool, and you are a, uh, a, a, a physics uh, major by background, right? Uh, that is not true, actually. Uh, I'm a professor no? at the physics department, <laughs> but uh, okay. my undergrad was electrical engineering, and I have a PhD like Abe uh, in electrical engineering from Princeton. Okay, so, so two electrical engineers and a chemist and a finance guy. This should be fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so uh, if, if we have, you know, a wide range of, of, of professions that we're drawing from, why would we have a talent shortage with respect uh, to quantum computing? Uh, Tina, let me, let me start with you there, because it seems like, you know, we've got a couple different areas that folks could come from here and, and participate in the industry. Yeah, so I think Abe pointed out rightly so that uh, quantum uh, mechanics, quantum information science, quantum computing, they're all interdisciplinary areas. So yes, we could draw from mathematics, chemistry, physics, electrical engineering, um, some could argue civil, mechanical. Um, the question is though, do, do we really prepare uh, our, our, our domestic uh, students to be successful in uh, and to be successful in the field. So in order to work in this industry, in this particular area, you have to have a higher level of education. So we're talking uh, certainly bachelor's, bachelor's degrees. Most of the jobs are there. They're in master's. They're in uh, people who have PhD degrees. So it takes a, a, a bit more effort to find yourself in a place where you could make a good living um, for being in this industry. So the question is, are we preparing K through 12 to be ready to go to the schools that have the, the requisite curriculum that will then prepare them to be in the industry? And I think the answer, unfortunately, is no. And that's a long uh, a standing problem that we've had in this country is that you know we have to do a better job of K through 12, whether it's in quantum of, and all STEM fields. Um, and so, you know, I could go through the statistics of the underrepresented in STEM, whether that be women, um, Blacks, um, Hispanics. We could do that. But I think the real uh, thing to do is figure out how we can take this opportunity now where when the industry is, is, is sort of just opening up um, and really engage uh, the broadest number and the broadest kinds of folks in, uh, in the field to get them prepared to have these kinds of jobs, so to be the workforce that we need in the future. It's it's interesting, Tina, you, you almost jog a memory for me all the way back to when I was in third grade and I saw my first Trash 80 computer. You know, that's how old I am, but I saw it in school and you know, I got the opportunity to kind of play with it and program it. And it really, you know, kind of set me down, you know, the, the, the path that I'm on today. You know, is there an equivalent in, in the quantum world that, that gets the, this technology into the hands of, of folks in, you know, before they hit university uh, that will expose them to it? Uh, Abe, I know that you've been doing some stuff around Kiskit. And, you know, what type of folks, what kinds of, what types of students are, 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 are participating there? Yeah, so maybe let's take a look at, first of all, the question about is there even such a thing like the one that you uh, were introduced to that set you on your career path? Um, it's only maybe 
four years ago, a little over four years ago, that quantum computers became available on the cloud. Before then, you needed access to a lab in order to work with quantum computers. And what that means is you needed to either be doing a master's or a PhD and somehow be participating in the research. But having the quantum computers on the cloud means now a quantum computer is in the hands of pretty much anyone with an internet connection. And that immediately brings the question of how do we how do we get people excited about using these quantum computers, right? There's certainly a lot of interest, but how do we get people excited about learning and using quantum algorithms? So what we're doing in our work is really trying to build materials that get people engaged in many different ways so that they can really start playing with quantum computers and understanding how they work. Uh, to answer your question of uh, exactly what uh, what are we doing in this uh, in this direction, we have many initiatives. Uh, pretty much all of them are digital that really try to bring in a large audience into this community. The community is very small, uh, and we're trying to bring in uh, more people so that we can upskill them. Now, the benefit of having quantum computers on the cloud is that you can turn the challenge of learning quantum computing from sort of a, a huge barrier to entry where you have to learn quantum mechanics and then you have to learn several things on the way. You can turn it, uh, turn the barrier a little bit lower into a question of programming. And that allows you to bring quantum yeah. computing far from the graduate level to maybe even at the undergraduate and high school level. And that's exactly the kind of work that we're seeing today and we're supporting in all of our quantum education work. Javad, I think that you're involved in some of that outreach right now. Can you talk a little bit about what, what you do? I know you were talking about some students just last week when we were setting up this panel. Yeah, so let, let me actually give a living example of what Abe just said, because it connects very well. I had a very motivated undergrad coming to me and say, I want to do quantum computing. I've read about Shor algorithm. And how can we do Shor algorithm? And then you saw you describe it that you need a circuit that had Josephson junctions in it. And how do you do Josephson junction? You have to evaporate aluminum. And then how do you do the aluminum? There is an evaporator. And he ended up actually changing the oil on that evaporator for, for a long time. And then he came and said, this is not quantum competing. And I said that you're absolutely right. But this is a huge field, right? I mean, it has all sort of legs, material science, engineering, coding, physics, comp algorithm, right? Uh, there is a, a space for everybody. You may have the tools, you don't know it, but it, like anything else, we also like to know how impactful things are. So I think with the fact that things are not on cloud, you can do a little bit of actual stuff, the real life hardware that is usually very hard in the lab. And then I say, you know, you learn how hard this thing is. That's the industry. They may hire in that area too. But now you can also look, go ahead and code a program that does short algorithm. And then if the program in you know, the hardware is not perfect, no the problem is starting. We go back to the evaporation. We go back to the material science. We go back to all that. So I think that has helped it a lot rather than having like great ideas and then you want to enter and you just, you're dismayed basically, right? So, but so, I think there's a, yeah. So let me push on something there because it sounds like, you know, traditionally in, in enterprise uh, computing and software, we kind of separate the, out the hardware folks from the software folks. And like, you know, you look at, for example, MIT, they have 6.1, 6.2, and 6.3. And 6.1 is more the hardware end, and 6.3 is more the, the computer science end. And so it lets these folks kind of go into their own silos. Is that actually doing us a disservice in the in the quantum world? Or, or you know, do we have that same sort of separation between hardware and and, and software? So I think in quantum computing at this at this stage, I don't know how it was like in 1960s. Um, it is I don't think if you can separate them, right? If you work with ions, there is yeah. a full fundamental understanding of that, and we know that we don't have a perfect quantum computer. To make that little improvement, you need to know the thing inside out, right? It's just not going to be like uh, I mean there are definitely generic algorithms and things that will basically map to everything, but if you don't know the details of how this thing works in the NISC era the noisy intermediate regime that we are right now with the errors that we have in the quantum computers. If you want that breakthrough, you have to know the hardware. That's just my personal opinion on this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree I think, with Javad I think that on goes this back part. To the, I There's mean, a lot that can be yeah, learned from absolutely. the hardware. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the focus, okay, ahead, I think Gina. it's important when you 
when you talk about where is the talent going to come from, someone in, you know, K through 12 undergrad, they may not really know exactly what they want to do. So I think it's really important to give uh, students an opportunity to have research experiences that are varied the way um, Javad just described. So if you can go in and understand how the materials work, what is a qubit, and then from there try to understand what is the logic gate that you need in order to go from a classical situation to a quantum situation. I think that's um, that's really important because the talent is, is there. I, I just want to keep emphasizing that. The question is, how do you engage them? How do you keep them uh, interested? And then people have to see what is the benefit. So we already know that if you get a job in STEM, that you're probably going to get paid more than if you get a job in some, some of the other fields that are out there. But we also know that we, we train people, and then we also sometimes lose them, Jeffrey, to the finance industry, right? So we <laughs> have to make sure that, that, they, that, we all, that all these things work in tandem. So um, I think it's important to, to under, for people to understand it's interdisciplinary. They need opportunities to connect research and education. Uh, we need opportunities or we need people to understand that are getting the training. What are the benefits of the training? What is the outcome once you have all this knowledge? Where can you take it? Um, and it needs to be real. If we're going to gauge people, engage people who are um, not typically in the STEM fields or in the quantum fields, they need to understand how it's going to put money in their pocket, how they're going to be able to take care of their fam families as a result of the hard work that they've had to put in to understand all these concepts that we're asking them to understand to be prepared for this this type of work. Can I add one so thing? Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just because it relates to Tina, three years ago I wasn't as experienced, and I had a student who came to me and said, "I love quantum computing," and he was an undergrad. And uh, I, I gave him all the great things about quantum computing. Right? You can do short algorithm. You can you know do searches. You, and uh, the IBM was just coming online, right? And so I, I basically wrote on the hype. I said, you know, this is fantastic, it's great. So he went and then he came back and he said, I want to switch fields. I want to go to biology, it's more promising. And uh, there I basically <laughs> had this long discussion and he basically said, you, did, you don't, I want to be real. I want to take things seriously. I want to know the challenges, right? And right now, if I factor a, a, a number on IBM Q, it gives you like 15, it gives me two by two. I mean, this was a long time ago, right? And it's, it's a wrong, I mean, it's not there, right? But it's just because I think, you know, we all talk about the great things, but the great things come with great challenges. And if they don't understand, I mean, they like to understand yeah. it. They want to be taken seriously. So they look at this stuff, which more challenges means more opportunity. And uh, two years ago, I really didn't realize this until it hit me that, he came to me and straight told me that, you know, you're wrong. I mean, if you, you're right on the hype, there is nothing there. I want the real and, and maybe, junction. Yeah. And maybe even to add to this, uh, this idea of inspiring students very early on, uh, maybe even at the K to 12 level. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Tina and I have sat on a panel that tried to lay out effectively what are the key concepts for future learners at the K to 12 level. All of these concepts, uh, even at the national level, are trying to make it so that we can teach quantum computing very early on, so that students can be motivated to think about issues in the field very early on. If you show a student uh, at the high school level how to program a quantum computer, they will very quickly run into the problems that are, that are obvious in the hardware, and they can immediately be inspired to think about how to solve those problems, which means they can tailor their undergraduate research experiences to solve those problems. So really bringing quantum computing mm -hmm. to, uh, to students' minds as early as possible um, and introducing it in different ways is, is a good idea from this perspective as well. Then there's also something that Tina touched on, which is, which is the, point, uh, the, the point about um, having a pipeline that's leaky at different points for uh, women and people of color. Now, in order to solve that problem, I think the solution is, again, to push things as close to the high school level um, before we start in seeing different parts of our talent pipeline that, that really bring in different barriers to different kinds of people. So mm -hmm. uh, all of this is to say it's very important from very different perspectives to bring quantum computing um, education efforts into the minds of the youngest, uh, the youngest minds of the future.
Let me put a question out yep. there, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit from, from one of our, our um, listeners. Um, I'll put it in the context of my own son, who you know, was a, was, you know, went, went to MIT and got a comp sci degree. And it's funny because in his coursework, they taught him all the ways to build a compiler and all the classical computing theory and everything. And then as his, in his internships, you know, they're all getting paid to write JavaScript and build APIs uh, for, uh, for, for, for Silicon Valley startups. How do you deal with that in the quantum world, uh, the same problem where you've got these folks that are extremely talented and I can't imagine that folks that have cross-disciplinary knowledge in something like material science and in electrical theory are, are, are very common. How do you keep them from you know, going to Wall Street or going to Silicon Valley? You know, what, what's, what's, the, what's the, the hook there for them? I can go on this uh, if, if it's okay. Um, so, okay. so in, in classes, <laughs> in classes that I teach, I had the students from Bloomberg. I had the students from American Express. Maybe it's the nature of the city, but I think right now everybody agrees quantum computing is revolutionary and it's very interesting, right? For fundamental reasons and for the way that it is set up, like everybody practically can contribute to it. Like it's such a vast field. Like you have the communication part of it, you have the security part of it. You can bring all the departments together. It's, to me, actually, it's the easiest topic if you want to have a multidisciplinary uh, project defined on it, right? And I think the young uh, students, you know, um, also know this thing. I mean, they, they kind of know what is exciting and, you know, what it brings money. And, and that may be two different things right now, but they know in 10 years, maybe the whole field switches. and. Uh, I see a lot of young uh, good coders and uh, even like physics background people that basically they say, I get a year gap, I want to do quantum computing now before I go to grad school. I'm not sure. And maybe to, um, to add to this, uh, Jeffrey, I think it's important to point out from an industry perspective as you're making these quantum computers, there are concepts that are necessary from an engineering perspective. So electrical engineering, for example, to work with the quantum computers and read out signals from them. Um, there are concepts that are important from a material science perspective. And so there's room for really all kinds of engineers and all kinds of scientists to join the field. What, what is important is for us to make the story of where they can contribute in the field. And I think that's going back to your question yeah. of how do we make sure people don't go off to other fields thinking this isn't a practical field. It's up to us now to explain clearly where people can contribute. But in reality, there is room for anyone to contribute, whether it's developing the quantum systems themselves at the hardware level or developing quantum algorithms for different applications, which really requires sort of a, a combined effort of many different fields coming together. Let me poke at that a little bit more. So yeah, when it comes to... to, yeah, go ahead, Tina. I'm sorry. I'm oh, sorry. I was just going to say. I think it's. I think it. We would benefit a lot from more uh, private, public engagement, and also academia in the K and twelve K through twelve. Um, if if young people actually see the practical side of what they could do with the education. I think that that would give them the onus to go about it. So if they don't know wh where they can put their energy, they're going to go with what, what is out there. And certainly Wall Street is out there. Um, uh, Silicon Valley is out there. But to understand that, that there, there are other careers and other directions you could go, I think is important. And, I, and to what Abe is saying, yes, it's our responsibility, those of us who are in academia and industry who uh, can see that we need this talent, it's our responsibility to to go to them, to go to the talent and let them know what opportunities there are there. I was thinking um, in my, in my, you know, sometimes I sit around and think, how can we solve some of these problems? So if I had a blank check, I would start a K through 12 program um, where we, where I would educate young folks about quantum and quantum information science, quantum computing, quantum materials, everything quantum, <laughs> and just really uh, in, in, engage them, give them opportunities to work in industry. And I would invite industry, I would invite PhD candidates to come to th these young people and talk to them about what they do every day, what kind of problems they solve, and ask them to, to help, you know, come together and say, why don't you help me solve this problem? A lot of young people, if you give them direction, they will 
take it on. They really will take it on. I don't think we've done that enough of that, not just in quantum, but in a lot of the areas that we need uh, to enforce our workforce in STEM. So I think we have real opportunity to to um, to come up with some unique ways to solve that problem. But certainly, if I don't know that the opportunity is out there, then I'm I'm going to do what my friends do. I'm going to you know work on Wall Street because I know I get a a nice check and I can go to all the restaurants and have my avocado toast or whatever. <laughs> and I don't have to study anymore, but you know, so we, <laughs> we, you know, we have to, we have to be more engaging basically. Is there, is there a, a part of this that, that relates to what, what the potential impact of quantum can be? So for example, uh, curing cancer, you know, with quantum computing or facilitating, um, you know, security and privacy or you know perhaps uh you know being able to uh, to open up um you know industry and in, in space you know what are the, the 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 things that fire people's imaginations that quantum can potentially be a part of um anybody i can give oh, you an oh. example uh, yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Dara. Yeah, please. Go ahead, Dara. Yeah. yeah so the, one of them that i really like which is not mainstream uh is a weather prediction so you see, there are problems that you can always solve it classically, but if you know the weather tomorrow in a week, it's not that useful. But with quantum computing, you can actually show with not a super crazy circuit, you may be able to actually get the answer right when you need it. And that can make a difference. And, and maybe to add to this, in terms of inspiring people, I think one thing to be cautious about is that we generally have to avoid, as Javad mentioned, kind of hyping the field and talking about things where we think quantum computers will be useful, as opposed to the reality of the situation, which is that the quantum computers today have limitations, but we expect them to be able to do this and that. So for me personally, one of the things I find exciting is that quantum computers, quantum systems in general, we're learning how to engineer them are excellent ways of uh, simulating the behavior of other quantum systems. So the way we understand nature effectively can be enhanced with our ability to engineer and manipulate quantum systems. And we've already seen significant contributions to this, right? So we've seen super sensitive um, detection of gravitational waves as a result of quantum effects. And there are so many things that we can, we can go through. But at the end of the day, I think we need to keep honest about what the promise of the field is because we risk, uh, we risk sort of bringing people in and then immediately giving them kind of the bad news that none of that works right now. So kind of an honest perspective of the field is uh, something that I personally always advocate for. Mm -hmm. the, um, yeah. I want to go... I want to go back to this issue of interdisciplinary studies because I think it's it's really important because it seems like often academic organizations and, and even K through 12 are not necessarily structured that way. You go to math class and then you go to science class or you take uh, comp sci uh, and you don't take any chemistry classes because all the comp sci things fulfill your requirements. Do we need to start thinking about teaching these subjects differently um, or when you're teaching quantum uh, concepts, do you have to essentially teach them in an interdisciplinary way? Tina, let me start with you on that. Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I want to add something to your question is that it's, there's, it's also in terms of research and to some degree education, it's also an expensive endeavor. Um, and so um, particularly for research. So I think it's important to, yes, it needs to be interdisciplinary. It's inherently inter interdisciplinary. I'm not so sure if we want to tackle teaching math differently. I just, I think we need to tackle what we're teaching in math and what we're emphasizing and how we're, how we're letting, uh, opening people's minds to what the application is. So, you know, teaching linear algebra is essential. We all, we know that for quantum, right? But um, what is the real application? So uh, because of COVID, I was not able to run my summer school this year as I normally would. So instead I have developed an online community mm -hmm. and I invited a, a professor of electrical engineering to teach a course, um, a math course that talks about, that, use, that uses concepts in electricity and magnetism so just to teach specific 
things about math and vector calculus in particular, right? And so the idea is that if a lot of these students have, have to or have taken electricity and magnetism, but they haven't necessarily seen how what they've learned what they're learning there um, could apply to solving and understanding more about quantum mechanics. So taking those opportunities to you know, just make the connections between what they already have to know and how those concepts can be used to understand what they're going to need to know in order to be successful in, in this field. Um, of course, mm -hmm. there are going to be some things that I can't, you know, predict, or, you know, that they're going to have to know that's going to be new. But there's a lot of things that, that they have to know now that we just really need to emphasize the importance of and show real practical ways of how they are applicable to the to this to the field. And Any maybe comments? to <laughs> add um, yeah I think I think you've made some very good points uh, but it all it all as Jeffrey was saying it all comes down to how do you teach something that's so interdisciplinary to so many different audiences, right? That's always a challenge because you have to pick and choose different parts of the field. Um, I think generally we say things like you need to know, um, so for example, Tina mentioned, you need to know linear algebra. At the end of the day, linear algebra itself is a field where you can get a PhD in. Um, you don't need to know that much linear algebra to get into quantum computing. Really what you need is um, to learn how to manipulate matrices and maybe do tensor multiplication. Right. And this is all something that is taught at the high school level. Uh, in order to know quantum computing, you need to know some quantum mechanics. You can get a PhD in quantum mechanics. Very, that's, that's a traditional path today, but you don't need to know that much quantum mechanics to join the field. All you need is a bit of intuition before you can start really solving problems in quantum computing. So the, the way to teach it while it's interdisciplinary, the challenge is how to pick and choose different parts of fields that are relevant to it, while also making sure that you're covering the necessary prerequisites for everyone. So a chemist may not have seen, for example, material that a physicist has seen. So how do you make sure that as you're teaching what you call the core quantum mechanics concepts, that both of them have the same coverage in terms of material? And the, the fundamental challenge of leading a quantum education team right now is exactly this. So in all of the materials, making sure that we're covering different kinds of backgrounds. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with Abe. I mean, this is actually a great point. Oh, sorry. No, and uh, actually, yeah. I want to give credit to Abe for uh, setting up this online uh, book that is, is so deep and is so fastly developing that depending on if you're an expert or you're just a high schooler, you can still go, to, go through the chapters and get a very good idea how, of how things are developing. But to me, uh, let me just, I guess, point out one thing. We had about 10 high school students in my lab in the last, I want to say, three years. And I think the most motivating part for them to kind of know how much of linear algebra and whatnot you need is basically the talks that they have heard from IBM. Like they basically, they want to know to what extent you need to go, right? And the only way to know that if you just, an expert giving you an example of that, this is how you, you need to do. You don't need to do a 10,000 line Qiskit programming. With 20 lines, you can do this. And in that 20 lines, there are five things to learn. And that's how you can kind of develop it. Yeah, we recently had a talk, quantum finance talk from Bloomberg, that I learned a lot. Uh, it wasn't like mathematically very difficult. It was just the way that we, we don't used to think that way. And, and I think that sort of this new kind of uh, setups for, for new thinking uh, would definitely is a motivation and also kind of is a path uh, for, for the younger kids to join in. I agree. Yeah, I think uh, all these are great points. Um, when I touched on the expense of it, I, I wanted to sort of think, have us think about how we could use something like distance learning um, because uh, if you don't have the resources to develop the curriculum, um, or if you're say K to 12, and you like you like uh, I believe uh, Abe mentioned, you have your your required um, curriculum things you have to to provide. Um, how can we figure out how to use things like distance learning to sort of enrich the things that um, the, the the requirements that are that are already out there? And so. Um, if you know, so we're somewhat in silos. So at some some places, are saying that 
in um, Washington, D.C., we don't, they, the K through 12 schools may not have the same resources as maybe a more affluent area in, say, Boston. But how can we connect teachers together and say, you know, I have the resources to give this extra bit beyond what is required for them to meet, you know, the standardized testing? How can I bring that into your classroom? That should be fairly easy. I don't know why we're not doing more of that. Um, and so I, I think that is key. If we go back to the idea of where the workforce is going to come from, it's about, to me, it's about shared resources, um, people not working in silos or being educated in silos. Some people are having experiences, access to, um, to higher level thinking about where quantum is going. And some people have no idea that, that you, those discussions are even happening. So we have to do better um, with making sure that that everyone has an opportunity to know the things that are going on and, and, and where the field is going and what are the new things, what are the old things, what are all the things that we have to, you know, work with in order to be, you know, to really have this workforce that we're talking about. So um, there are examples of, of this problem being solved. Um, you know, I think about the Clemson Center for Automotive Research down here near where I live or, you know, things like management and technology degrees or uh, biomedical engineering uh, majors. You know, do we need something like that uh, to, you know, to, 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 to start to solve the, the, the skills gap from a quantum perspective? So maybe I can, uh, I can start here and uh, just give you an example of, as we're talking about the skills gap, just how much relative to the skills gap, just how much interest there is to join the field. Um, so we talk about this skills gap, but also I think what's relevant is what we're offering from a quantum education perspective. So we started, um, uh, the, the, the IBM quantum team started a plan for a summer school this year to teach 200 students, for example, because that's just the generally the size of the workforce that we've been looking at and that that summer school quickly grew the interest that we saw from the 200 that we expected to 5000 people and mm -hmm. that shows That's you awesome. how mm -hmm. the, how simultaneously we underestimate the the kind of interest in the field and also kind of overestimate mm -hmm. the the kind of the gap that there is with quantum education i think we can bridge the the skills gap that we have given that there's just so much interest right now. So 5,000 people, uh, almost 5,000 people are going through daily three hour lectures for the past seven days now. And they're taking notes with online learning from all corners of the world, from a hundred countries. And this is something that is just unprecedented in the field of quantum computing, right? Something mm -hmm. at this scale. So mm -hmm. as much as we talk about a skills gap, I think simultaneously, we also need to consider there is a lot of interest in joining the field. People are asking the question yeah. of what should I learn? What are the prerequisites? And how do we, we as people in the field right now, make it easy for someone to join the field instead of setting up barriers of you have to learn quantum mechanics and then you have to learn this and then you have to learn that. You have to climb all these walls instead all of the people who are taking this course right now are effectively taking half to a full semester worth of quantum algorithms at the university level packaged into a summer school, which is just fascinating to me to think about. So it shows you, as we're talking about a skills gap, that we also have to account for how much interest there is in the field. I agree with Abe. I mean, we definitely, I mean, IBM is doing a phenomenal yeah. job to me because maybe I'm closer, you know, and, and I see yeah. more, but I think every industry partner and, and this quantum, they, they should contribute, they, they should do more. And um, because, you know, at some point it, it becomes like a big data kind of thing. There will be so many resources, now you cannot pick which one is, is, is suited for you. And then you need another skill to kind of do that choosing. But having these centralized, effective, uh, packages that are coming out and by the experts in the field, by the people who are actually making the hardware and developing it. And maybe there is an equivalent version for IONS and, and other platforms that I'm not aware of. I think the more we have, the better it is. Yep. Um, 
Let me ask a question from from a related field. Um, you know, we also see a lot of folks getting pulled into to AI, and I know the one of the jokes for a while was all the physicists, all the, uh, the the physicists that were being produced by uh, higher education were getting uh, pulled into becoming data scientists because they were used to handling large, messy data sets, and and that's exactly what was needed in in the um, in, in in the AI space. But one of the things from an educational standpoint that we had that we're grappling with in that space is is the ethics of applying AI. Do we see a similar thing here in the quantum space? Are there ethical concerns that are going to pop up, and does that become part of the educational curriculum that we put together? And if so, what what are they? So ethics, uh, to me at least, means a couple of different things. One is making sure that our usage of quantum computing, the technology, um, is not for harm, but for good, for solving the problems of humanity. That's one aspect to it. And um, there are different groups of people thinking about this and trying to imagine what a good way to, um, to account for quantum computing ethics would be in curriculum development. So that's one side of it. The other side of the, generally, when we talk about quantum computing ethics, what worries me is that as quantum computers develop further and further, um, I would like to make sure that we maintain open access to the quantum computers for anyone who wants to learn, that we keep the field welcoming, and that we don't close off doors for anyone who wants to join the field. Uh, given the scale of impact that we expect from quantum computers, it's it's a reasonable concern to make sure that we keep access to quantum computers open. And so both of these perspectives are important to me from a, from a quantum computing ethics perspective. And this is something I'm passionate about and we can talk for hours, but I'll let the other panelists also chime yeah. in. I I just, uh, I... just to piggyback on what, oh. Yeah, go ahead, Tina. Can, so just to, just to add to what was just said, for me, um, the idea of diversity and uh, in quantum uh, computing is very important because if it's not diverse, if it's not open, then the question could be left to what problems are we solving using the technology? And if there's not representation that's broad, then some um, problems that need to be solved that impact certain communities may be sort of left out. And I would, would not like to see you know, that happened. I think that's something that's happened in other industries. And I think it's very important that, um, you know, based upon, you know, as Abe just articulated, it needs to be open because we need to make sure that it's, um, that it's more than fair, I'll put it that way, that's equitable in terms of how we apply the technology that's being developed. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Tina and Abe. And I just want to add a quick comment that uh, and quantum computing is really difficult. I mean, it's very challenging. And I think inclusion of everyone with all resources across the globe is to our benefit of the humanity in general. Like we can solve problems we have never thought we can solve, but we need everybody to do it. Mm -hmm. So I think an international effort being open about it is, is, is totally good. Having, you know, all sort of, you know, we, we have to be very inclusive. Also, I guess, you know, like any other technology like AI, it will be good uses and bad uses for quantum as well, right? The very famous one is security, right? You can hack the current network with the quantum computer. You can make a very secure network with entangled photons. So I think there will be always this kind of back and forth, but but definitely like any other industry, there will be a solution. Um, I don't think it will be just a bad icon. I, I really think that point about keeping the access to the technology open resonates in some ways. Uh, quantum computers right now feel very much like to me, like mainframes in the very early days where you've got to be very, very well financed to be able to afford to install and run one. You're not going to order it off of Amazon or Newegg anytime in the near future. Uh, so if we want to inspire folks, you know, to, to go into these careers, they've got to be available so that they can actually, you know, figure them out and, and work against them. So it, it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I want to tell the folks out in the audience that we are taking questions as they come in from the audience. And, and many of the questions that I've asked have been from, from our audience. If you have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, I am going to go into one area though related to one of those questions. And when I think about, you know, firing the imagination of, of folks to come into the space, one of the, the things I think a lot about 
um, from raising children and, and, and raising STEM kids was something like uh, FIRST Robotics and the impact that that had at the high school level in terms of creating interdisciplinary teams that were out there programming robots and learning how to do IoT and seeing out how to apply calculus in the, you know, with a PID loop. Um, do we need something like that for, for quantum? And if so, what does that end up looking like? You know, I look at, at a kid that went from the football team to manufacturing with a 3D printer that was knocked together to now manufacturing rocket nozzles uh, coming out of out of Penn State. And, and it just, you, to me, that's about as interdisciplinary as you can get, even at the high school level, or even if you look at something like Scratch, you know, are there quantum equivalents that we're going to see that are gonna drive this technology down uh, into, uh, into those folks? And, and if so, what are they? Yeah, so the, <laughs> I think this yeah. is, for anyone who wants to see exactly what these kinds of things look like, they do exist. Um, we host so many hackathons around the world with this exact reasoning in mind. And my the favorite part of my job is seeing people at these hackathons, maybe a group of five, a musician and a physicist and a chemist and a material scientist working together to write code to solve some problem that all of them are thinking about in many different perspectives. Uh, we, we call these Kiskit camps and I strongly recommend, I know Javad, um, you've, you've been to some of these Kiskit camps, your students have participated. I strongly recommend for anyone to see the real enthusiasm and excitement about the field to come to one of these hackathons because you'll see just how all of these different groups and backgrounds are coming together to solve problems. And I, there are also recaps of these hackathons online. So if you look for uh, Kiskit camp recaps, and I'm happy to point you to specific ones, I think you'd see just the range of projects from coming up with creative ways to teach others to solving physics problems to contributing to the open source projects uh, in quantum computing, our open source code to interact with the quantum computer. So really, these things do exist uh, and they're just starting up now. It's, it's fairly early days for quantum computing in that regard. I want to actually give you an example of something that they can build, and Abe actually has seen it in our lab. So it was last year, the high school students, they actually built a three-axis Hummel's coin that acts as a single qubit. So by applying a magnetic field, I wish I was in the lab, I could have brought it out. It was like a 10-inch thing that you actually, uh, you apply magnetic field, and it actually can, uh, with Kiskit, you can program it to look like an arrow that goes up and down in a single qubit. And now this year, the students are making... Um, I guess they are adding the Raspberry Pi to it, so it becomes like a portable thing that they can take it to their high school and then show it to other kids. But then you have to do the programming of the Raspberry Kid. You have to make a power supply that is cheap enough to do it. You have to make this like all these coils like properly done. It, it has become a phenomenal project to me. This is something that you just imagine, how can I visualize a single qubit operation from a point that now you are doing Kiska programming and this, this block is, it is doing exactly what it, you want it to do. So I think those things uh, can become more advanced and, and it gives a very nice visualization for a quantum community because we cannot go alone, right? We need other people to join in. I guess like what Tina was saying, you know, you need, uh, uh, you need people with the same interest and, you know, the hackathons that Abe is talking about are a great, you know, resource. If you just go there, you will find 200 friends immediately, right? And that's exactly what we need with quantum. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And maybe to so from the point material out- side, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. So maybe to point out Javad's uh, Javad's example of the students building that that Helmholtz coil arrangement, you can see just how fundamentally interdisciplinary the field is, even just from that example. So some students are having to think about the quantum mechanics of flipping a qubit and what it takes to flip the qubit and what it takes to apply operations on a quantum bit. Um, and some students are thinking about the programming aspect of it. Other students are thinking about the classical electronics that's needed to drive all of this work. So this is the kind of interdisciplinary effort generally that you need in quantum computing. And so projects like these that are very interdisciplinary that bring in people with different kinds of backgrounds are exactly the kinds of projects that we encourage at these hackathons. So when we think about access so from a and, and opening up, go ahead, I'm sorry, Tina. 
I'm sorry. I just wanted to add from a material side. I'm still amazed that we, you know, that I could look at a tonic electron microscope image of a two dimensional material and uh, and that yeah. at room temperature, I can demonstrate the spin and diamond or some other color center and its relation to a qubit. So the fact that I could do those kinds of things at room temperature and see these properties of, say, graphene at room temperature is um, is amazing to me. Uh, now, I think from the material side, you do get more of a from a more of a fundamental point of view. Uh, it's not as you know um, as as you know. Ex I want to say like uh, sexy. Excuse me for saying, it, but like it's not as sexy maybe as like a hackathon. You have to actually go in the lab and you know uh, and see you know set up this whole system and to do a, a, to get an electron microscope image is a little bit more painful in that sense um you're not going to have like you know a hundred or a thousand people going into lab and looking at a two-dimensional image but but i still think that um just knowing once you explain to someone that something as thin as a uh, one atom a material could have such interesting properties i think you could really you know that could be exciting to a lot of people I have to say the ability to control, you know, matter, you know, at that level just does seem kind of cool if you think about it and being able to see it. Um, right. So when we think about, you know, opening up access and keeping access open uh, as broadly as possible, um, cloud hosted quantum computers certainly seem one way to do that. Open source uh, seems another way to do that. Are there countervailing trends that we have to be wary about? So for example, things like export restrictions or uh, proprietary code at, at this point um, that are going to, to be potential challenges uh, that we have to overcome. I'm just curious where you see the industry right now. I, I, From, mean, uh, I can give you the academic version. And I think academically, yeah. as Abe mentioned earlier, we are not there. And that's the fact. The hardware is very hard. And I think right now our focus should be on solving those problems and having a real quantum computing, you know, and then be having a useful thing. And then we can decide, you know, how we, we want to do it, right? Uh, but when we are not there, just limiting ourselves, it's just going to take the journey longer and, and more painful. So that's what I think immediately comes to me. Yeah, and from an industry perspective, I really think there is an opportunity here to learn from many different fields by opening up access to everyone. And that's been very productive. Uh, just working at IBM, I can tell you seeing different clients working together with IBM to come up with different applications has been a very productive way to do things. And I'm, I'm, I'm a fierce advocate for that kind of thing. At the same time, I will point out the field is also starting to get fairly competitive. We're starting to see many different companies pop up with different interests in the field. So we still have some very interesting things to see about the field going forward. Um, but what I will say is what has been successful so far in the field, which is to maintain open access for everyone so that people can contribute, whether it is by opening up access to the hardware or open sourcing the software, which are both things that we've done. Cool. We've got a couple minutes left and I wanna go ahead and close up, but I'd like to ask each of you if there's one thing that you would like um, the press and the media to know about the quantum space and, 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 and think it's very important for, for them to understand. What is it? Um, let me start with you, Tina. I think it's important to know that the quantum space is a space, there, there's, there could be a place for a lot of different people in the quantum space. Um, and that we have an opportunity to, um, to really invite as broad a participation as necessary to improve our workforce uh, resources, to uh, keep young people engaged, um, and provide a direction in terms of a career and a way to make a life for themselves. Um, I think it's important to understand that although there's a lot of mystery but behind quantum science, behind quantum mechanics, it is attainable if we invest now and invest smartly in how we um, educate people whether that's a K-12 person who's just starting out 
uh, in education, getting the fundamentals, or whether that's the broader uh, community so that they could get behind the idea that we need to put and we should put more resources behind quantum um, education. And also, I, I think ultimately there's a, a way to, um, to, to approach the education uniquely. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't be afraid of that. We should try to meet that challenge. Okay. Um, Dr. Shabani. Maybe, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I guess uh, adding to Tina's, um, and then also the, the relationship with industry, like all the students at the end of the day want to do something that is exciting and also there is a, there, there is a job after that, right? So the partnership between industry and academia and the development of how industry is growing is going to basically dictate how many students we're going to get out. And can we get the best students in this field, right? If, if industry is doing, you know, uh, making like larger scale systems and they are like, uh, solving great problems, then all the students basically want to come. If they know that there is no job at the end, they're basically just not going to come and start it. If industry wants the best people to come to IBM and, for example, to kind of work on quantum computing, yeah, so, so it is basically a hand in hand uh, kind of operation. But I think for that, there is also a medium, which is just the community part of it, right? We want to be honest, we want to be serious, we know there are serious challenges in the field, and more challenges make it more exciting. You know, we see a lot of news articles coming out about uh, this thing and that thing, which I, I, I respect them. I know that the, there, uh, there is a mentality behind it, but I think at the same time, for when you come to education, you want to only stay with the real stuff. You want to basically be clear where we are, what are the challenges, and that's what the students enjoy the most. We should take them seriously and give them a community. Abe? Uh, from a quantum education perspective, uh, so following up with uh, points that both Tina and Javad brought up, uh, we're, we're announcing today opening up the IBM Quantum Educators Program. And the goal of this program is to make sure that anyone, as they're teaching a quantum computing course, can use our devices. So this gives access to any educator to sign up for time to reserve on the devices so that they can teach during the lecture using these systems and also to be able to assign homeworks to students. So we've prepared not only access to the devices, the open access that we talk about, we've also put an open source online textbook on quantum computing that allows students to learn how to program quantum computers as they're going through, through traditional quantum computing courses. And our goal with all of these efforts is to make sure that as students are learning quantum computing, they're working with the real systems. Just like if you are taking a chemistry course, you would have a lab associated with it. We'd like to make quantum computing something that's tangible, something that students can work with. And so this is our way of making access open for everyone around the world. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to, uh, to look at the IBM Quantum Educators Program, especially now as we're gearing up for the fall 2020 semester. Cool. I want to thank all of you for being willing to tolerate the questions of a you know, dumb finance guy. But, uh, you know, I learn so much whenever we do one of these panels. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, really great to be able to talk to you guys about what you're doing and, and some of the exciting things that, that are, um, you know, not too far around the corner. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.